always touch on is lighting. And it doesn't matter what your level of photography is, whether you're just beginning, even with an iPhone, on up to a pro level with medium format digital SLRs, we're all dependent on light. It is true, cameras today are so amazing with their capability of capturing images at high ISOs that you can take pretty much a good picture, I say a good picture, in just about any scenario. But it doesn't mean it's a great picture. If you look at pictures and notice what you're attracted to, most often than not, it's gonna be the moment, then it's gonna be the light, because the light really defines what we're seeing. As a photographer, we can't practice our craft without light. So what I wanna share with you are some speed light techniques that I use. I happen to like the small portable flashes because 90% of everything I do is on location and I don't need a big punch of light. So speed lights are the right tool for me. And I could shape them to get the quality of light I want to emulate what I could accomplish in a studio. And then we're, in closing, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna share with you no excuses. So again, if you're just starting out, don't worry if you don't have a budget for all the cool fancy toys like speed lights and light modifiers. You can go on a limited budget, on a limited budget and go to your home improvement store and pick up some lighting tools, like a shop light, a spotlight. You could even, for color gelling, use file folder dividers that you could pick up at any you know, Office Depot or any place where office supplies are sold. And I'll show you through the power of creating light what you could do with those. So if you wanna learn more about myself and my wife Dawn, we do workshops, we do education, because we really believe in empowering the craft of photography please visit davisworkshops.com. So if you have any questions, you can just type them in and we're gonna go through my workflow. So one of the things that we're gonna go through, I'm using a program called Photo Mechanic, which is just a simple viewer program. And I'm gonna start off again with the tools that I use and some of the techniques that I use to shape that light. So I use, let me get back to a single image here. There we go, just want that single image. So this is what I travel with all over the world. And I shoot weddings, portraits, events, headshots, corporate, everything. And like I said, I don't have a studio. I work on location. My work takes me on location. I don't need the overhead of a studio. But I could create the quality of light I want anywhere, anytime. So as Cy said, I'm a Canon Explorer of Light, so I shoot with Canon equipment. And I happen to love shooting a big, beefy, hardy camera. I love the 1DX. I virtually shot a wedding last year in, uh, in tropical storm conditions. The wedding went on. The camera is weather sealed, as are all of the L-series lenses. So for my level of work, I need the top of the line gear. And like the old Timex commercial, it took a licking and kept on ticking. I mean, I was shooting in downpour of rain. The speed lights kept working not an issue at all. Batteries are key with small portable flashes. So I happen to use the PowerX 2700 milliamp rechargeable batteries made by Maha. And you can pick them up at B&H or, or online anywhere. They're rechargeable, but they don't have any long shelf life. So this enables you to get the best possible output from your flash and the quickest recycle time that it's capable of your batteries won't get in the way. So I'm able to pretty much shoot an entire shoot eight to 12 hour wedding on these rechargeable batteries. I also have an external battery pack that I use. This is a low voltage battery pack by Canon. Nikon makes the same type as do most all speed light and flash companies. Now the thing about speed lights, which I'm gonna talk about, is they have different capabilities. So there is a definition, let me just jump ahead here, between a speed light, a flash, and a strobe. So a speed light, we'll call it a smart flash because it has the ability to wirelessly communicate with an off-camera flash as well, getting instructions from a master device on your host camera. So this is the Canon system, and this is the FTE3, which is just a speed light commander sending out instructions to an off-camera flash or speed light. The speed light is capable of being a flash, a remote, or 
a master transmitter. So you could send instructions from either one. There's two forms of communication. So Canon has the built-in radio communication. Nikon and all other speed lights for camera manufacturers rely on line of sight, meaning the master and slave unit need to see one another which at times when you're using certain light modifiers or if you're outside in bright lighting conditions can be a challenge. So I'm a huge fan of radio transmitters. It allows you to have non-line of sight communication. This is the back of my camera. So all of our cameras from point and shoots to our pro level cameras and there's even apps where you could see this on your iPhone show you the histogram. The histogram is just a fancy name for showing our exposure and color. So I, I talk about this quite a bit. I never rely on the LCD screen to let me know that my exposure and my color is good. Heck, everything looks great on a three inch screen. I don't want to get back home and start editing my images and see that it might be too red or it might be too bright or it might be too dark. In essence, this is my color meter, the RGB scale, which is red, green, and blue. And this is my exposure scale, which is aluminum. Left being the shadows for zero, right being the highlights for the bright points. What I really care for for a good exposure is information from left to right. So my highlights are not spiking up off of the right side. I still have information here. And there's very little shadow information, which is true of this image. If we look at this image, it's very brightly lit. It's outside but I still have detail in the highlights and in the shadows. Now my criteria for good color is a nice warm flesh tone with neutral whites. I achieve this by making sure my red, green, and blue levels are near equal in length. So if something goes too far to the right, it means that the image is gonna be predominantly either warm or cool. So I could correct that in camera through my white down preset. And that's a whole nother webinar in and of itself. But this, if I check these levels in camera, when I get back into post-production, whether you're using Lightroom, Photoshop, Aperture, any image editing software to view your images, you're not gonna be disappointed because these same values will come through there. So if I go to full information on my photo mechanic, you can see my exposure for this image. There it is, my color is good, everything is in alignment. My exposure is good, with a slight spike up the right side for this high key white background, right? When we get to the images, I'll pop on that as well. So that's the 1DX, it's a beast. It's you know virtually waterproof as long as you don't dunk it in the river. As I said, I've shot it in downpours and rain and ice, and I need a level of camera to perform like this in the conditions that I shoot. That's the Canon Speedlight system, and all speed Speed light systems are amazing. Nikon has a great speed light system. Sony does as well. As I said, their only other limitation is they need to see one another, line of sight, which can be a challenge for some of the lighting techniques that I'm going to share. There are many lighting triggers out there these days that are available that will work with your particular brand of speed light. And as I was saying before, these are speed lights. A flash, just a straight up flash like a Vivitar, a Luma Pro, they just emit light. So they just pop out the light, manual mode, and they work great. That's a flash. A strobe is something big, a monoblock, three, four, 500 watt seconds for a flash head with a power pack. Those are strobes. Speed lights work great for me because I take everything in my Think Tank Airport International bag or my other Think Tank rolling bag and I pack it up all my primary gear stays with me when I'm traveling, and I can hit the ground running. I'm never separated when I fly from my gear because if I land to do an assignment, I don't have my cameras, lenses, and flashes, I can't do my job. So we need to be able to have our gear with us. The other bag is for my digital darkroom, which I take with me everywhere I go. My laptop is still my primary machine, even at home, because I do so much work on the road. Dawn, my wife, she's the designer, the graphic designer, so she has the big tower. I'll bring my images in through my Lexar multiple card readers, download them to a backup hard drive while on site, and then I will call and every edit things within my laptop using Photo Mechanic. 
This is a backup drive. And then this is a bootable clone drive, which I use. So every day my laptop gets cloned. So if for whatever reason, if I'm out on a job and my internal hard drive and my laptop will not boot up, I can plug in my clone drive and I have everything I need, all my software, passwords, email, it's current and up to date, and I could boot from that drive. I use a program called Carbon Copy Cloner. So, so there's many programs out there for Mac and PC, but I happen to like that one. It works really great for me. And I never have to worry. So my, my old photo editor who hired me at the Chicago Sun-Times said, kid, come back with a good picture or don't come back at all. You can't publish an excuse. And I've embraced that my entire career from photojournalism into wedding and portraits now. So I used to light way back when, but I used to have to haul around monoblocks and you need an assistant, you need outlets, you need cables. Now I could create a studio anywhere, anytime on location. So here's a variety of light modifiers. I happen to love the Westcott products because A, it's a great quality of light. B, they're lightweight and they're portable, meaning I could compact and fold them up all off an umbrella shaft. This is a medium soft box with a recessed front panel that we could put a grid in. This is a strip light, so it's a narrower type of soft box to shape the light. This is one of my go-to favorites. It's they shoot through an umbrella called the halo and it has a backing on it. And that's my uh, Wonder Dog assistant, Hunter. So we were doing a senior shoot in, in our home studio, right? She came to our house and this was the set that we used and I'll share some of those photos with you in a moment. So here's the medium soft box. I use this a lot on wedding day for portraits of two to three to four people maximum. Soft boxes by nature are very directional. I don't know why they gave them the name soft box but they actually produce a directional light, which can be harsh depending on where the shadow falls. Where the halo is a very soft light because it's 180 degrees from top to bottom, left to right. Soft wraparound light. And another big advantage with the halo for speed light is anytime you're using a shoot through umbrella, a certain amount of light hits the satin material and reflects back. Well, the halo has this covering which is encapsulating of the back of the umbrella and it's silver on the interior thereby harnessing that light and maximizing the output and it's also versatile meaning you could pay, face the speed light flash head out toward the front for maximum efficiency and recycle time or you could diffuse it even more by facing the flash head toward the back bouncing off of the silver and diffusing the light even more for a softer look so the combination of the Halo and the Apollo is kind of my perfect pair, my go-to kit that I bring for my formals and portraits at weddings and general events or just corporate work. This is a rapid box and this happens to be a smaller rapid box with a reflector plate here. This emulates the quality of light such as a beauty dish. So if I'm doing a senior portrait or a single beauty shot of the bride, I'll use this device because it gives me that beautiful light to create that butterfly shadow right under her nose. The key is with this smaller rapid box is the reflector plate. So that's what makes it have the quality of light such as a beauty dish. Now there's also a diffusion sheet that goes over the front of this which really gives it a beautiful quality of light and still remain portable. Beauty dishes in general are quite large and hard to transport and not very portable. So it's a great solution and it's designed to work with small strobes and speed lights. Here's my other, my other favorite kit to go to. This is by Rogue. So Rogue has gels, which I use all the time at events, weddings, portraits, to change a plain white wall, to give it an accent color for just creativity. These are color correcting gels as well. So if I'm in an environment, which I'm going to share with you that is predominantly tungsten lit, I will take my speed lights and put a full correct to orange gel on them, changing their color temperature from daylight to tungsten. So then I could shoot in the tungsten white balance preset and all the color of all my light will match. Thereby I get true flesh tones and nice coloring in both tuxes and dresses and just general clothing in and of itself. Also have your grids for shaping the light, 
a small soft box if you chose to have one on camera or a medium one with diffusion off camera. Now what's convenient about these devices is they'll also roll up and shape them to become a snoot, which is another means for shaping the light. All these cool light modifiers and toys really do is shape and change the quality of the light that's coming from a speed light or a flash. This happens to be a Canon speed light connected to the Canon CPE4 battery pack. And again, I put the rechargeable batteries in both and I could go all day with this. Here's some of the color correcting gels I was speaking of. If you're photographing corporate work or if you're photographing within a school, more often than not, the lighting in there is going to be fluorescent. So what I do is I put the plus green filters over the speed light and then I use the fluorescent white balance preset in camera. Thereby it removes the entire green cast that the fluorescent lights will give off in the background. These are just theatrical gels, which you can use again for accent color. Now if you look really closely, you'll notice that this speed light has an orange gel on it, the correct tube orange. But there's no color shift. My white is white, the color is true, because I'm shooting in the tungsten white balance preset. And then again, you can see in the histogram, all the colors are in alignment as well. And there's those Maha PowerX 2700 milliamp batteries. They're great batteries, as I said. They're gonna give you nice recycle time and a good punch to last you throughout the day. Now, if you're using the older systems, or the Nikon system, there are many radio interpreters that will allow you to break the limitation of line of sight. So this is my 1DX with the older Canon optical system, the 580s and the STE2. Now there's a product that's out called the Radio Popper. So this is just an interpreter. It captures the optical information from the speed light master device. It needs to have a master device to read instructions from. Converts those signals to a radio signal, sends it out to a receiving unit, and then that receiving unit, see there's their transmitter and receiver, gathers that radio information and decodes it back optically in a seamless fashion. As I said before, there's now many alternatives on the market. I've just been using radio poppers since their inception and they've worked for me. Now I still use them as a backup as well because oftentimes I'm in a situation where I reach a limitation for the Canon's radio communication. This is a remote speed light with a light sphere on it. So it's another light shaping device that gives you a nice quality of light with the radio popper receiver. Now because I run around a lot with my lighting and I move my light stands quite a bit, I just put a rubber band around them to secure them so that they don't move and fall out of place to obtain maximum communication. Here's a newer radio popper device. This is my go-to backup. With the Canon 600 EXRT systems, they rely on the same frequency as most wireless devices and Wi-Fi, 2.4 gigahertz. I shoot in big ballrooms where my band will be a 20-piece band and they'll set up their own network with a router on each side of the band to transmit the wireless signals to their iPads for music, to their wireless microphones, to the wireless mics for their instruments. So sometimes I get into too much traffic and it quenches the Canon's radio communication. So I need a backup and this is it for me. So I put the 600 XRT in the Radio Popper JR2 receiver. Here is the transmitter and as you can see, I have four groups and I can control that flash output, the amount of light that comes from it, from this master device. Now it's not ETTL, meaning through the lens metering, but it's manual mode and allows me to vary the power between four different groups. And it's gonna work with a 1600 foot range and it's not on the same frequency as wireless devices. It's still on the older 900 megahertz frequency. So it's very reliable. Here's a less expensive, um, I would say just a dumb trigger. So it has four channels, no groups, everything fires all at once. So if you had four speed lights out there, they all fire simultaneously and you cannot adjust the power from a master device. It's just a dumb trigger, it just fires your flashes. 
So you could get into this type of lighting with off-camera flash and radio capabilities, very inexpensive. You could pick up a Luma Pro flash for about 90 bucks. You could pick up a pair of these guys for 60, and it's all manual, and you're good to go. As I said before, if you don't need the speed light capabilities of all the cool functionality that they bring with them, you could save yourself some money. So if you'd like to take me with you and have the opportunity to learn at your own pace, to go on a corporate shoot, an engagement shoot, a wedding shoot, a portrait session, check out my DVD. It's a downloadable DVD, What the Flash, and that's available at mzed.com, mz.com. All right, so now we're going to get into a little bit of how I use speed lights. So I'm just going to pop around a little bit. So I know I shared with you my studio. I was doing something on location, right? And here's some of my speed light images. Well, here's the images that I was able to create in that setting. This is one off-camera speed light communicating with a master device on my camera and then a remote speed light within the Apollo medium softbox. Beautiful quality of light. Now I have Gigi, our model, relatively close to the backdrop. So it's one light illuminating her, and then the light falls off to a gradual, almost gray background. So let's pop over and check out those camera settings. So if we come over here, I know it's probably hard to see on your screen, but it gives me the metadata. So I was shooting at aperture 5.6, a 60th of a second, the flash was firing, and I was in daylight white balance. I like my flesh tones to be human and warm, so you could see it's slightly red. Now, I could overcorrect this if I chose to and take that warmth out, but then Gigi would look pale and pasty and very white, almost bluish. Now, this image, same lighting setup, same light modifier, but we just moved about five feet away from the background. So this is kind of that inverse square law. The further we move away from the background, the greater the light will fall off, thereby getting darker. So now this white background paper is turning gray. If we moved about 10 feet away to 12 feet away, that background paper would go black. But the quality of light from one speed light in that medium softbox is outstanding. If you're ever wanting to know how someone created a photograph, the highlights in their eyes give it away. By the catch lights, you could see if there was a fill card. You could see the shape of the light modifier square being the softbox, right? One light not too far to camera left, so we keep this nice soft shadow on the right side of her, or left side of her face. If I move the light too far to camera left, this shadow would be very deep, harsh, and extend down her cheek. It would be very unflattering for a woman, but it could be very masculine for a man. So this is just moving the angle, asking Gigi to turn her face toward the light. Again, beautiful quality of light, one speed light, one light modifier. Great result. Now you want to get into something a little bit more studio-esque, a little bit more fun. So we shot these for her when she was a senior in high school. Her inspiration was the movie Burlesque, hence the makeup and the costume she was wearing. So we took the white seamless paper and we added lights to it. So now we're lighting the background. And you need to evenly light the background. So that's what those strip boxes were for. One left, one right one left, one right, evenly lighting my background, and one big seven-foot parabolic umbrella with one speed light in it directly shooting toward her, and I'm standing in front of it. But it's such a big light source that it just wraps around me. Again, this is all with speed light. Turn the music on, get a fan blowing, and away we go. Beautiful image. Again, let's just check that histogram. No color shifts. Sure, everything's leaning to the right because this is very high key, very white. Most magazine shoots, covers, they love the high key look because they could drop text in very easily. Here's the set, right? So any place, no excuses, can be a studio. For some of the time, you could use a white sheet. Other time, it's white background paper. Uh, this white flooring, which looks kind of glossy, is again a Home Depot special. It's white tile board and it's about $15 a sheet, thereby giving you a reflective surface to work with, right? A little bit of uh, creativity there. Home Depot's got a lot of cool stuff. So here's the seven-foot parabolic umbrella with one speed light in it, which 
was my main light from the front. Now this is getting crazy cool studio quality lighting from small portable speed lights. And you could take this anywhere. Now again, you could use the Rogue smaller light modifiers and then you can use hardware store stuff to create beautiful lighting as well. There's no excuses. So you can see this one speed light is illuminating the entire seven foot umbrella. Right? So let me pop out of here really quick and let's go into a few more practical things. So these are all portraits and one of the things I hope you can see is the consistency of color in exposure. And there's so many variations on what you can do and the creativity you could create with speed lights. Right? Here's, here's another fun example. So I was doing a shoot on the streets of New York. We were there for a B&H workshop and we were illustrating what you could do with two speed lights just anywhere on the street. So we were using the Halo and the Apollo, my two favorite light modifiers. We grabbed the model and it was crazy terrible weather, raining, and we didn't need a permit because there's no power packs. We couldn't do cables and power packs because it was raining and freezing cold and it just wouldn't work. So here we are just going down the street looking for interesting backgrounds, taking pictures. So bam, we put a blue gel, one of those rogue creative blue gels on the umbrella in the background and because there's a radio trigger, I can fire that background light. My main light in the front was the softbox with no color filtration at all. Beautiful quality of light. Look at that. And there, these are straight out of camera files. I'm not going to retouch photos. I'm not going to color correct because I want you to show. I want to show you that you can get this great craft, great quality of images in camera. So let's take a look at that histogram. Look at that. What's all that blue? That blue is because I used a colored blue gel on my backlight. So of course it's going to record a lot of blue. But her flesh tone is beautiful, right? So let's keep poking around. We went inside because it was raining like crazy and the model was chilled. I'm like, oh, okay, while we're in here, let's make a shot. I love the raindrops. I noticed the raindrops on the window. So I'm like, cool, we can use that. So I was going to tell the model to look out the window and I left the speed light in here to be my backlight because again, it's radio controlled, no limitation on communication. So here's the first image I came up with. Beautiful one speed light outside, no backlight yet, and we're holding it high and above her face so that the light cascades downward, creating a beautiful look, dreamy feel. Now we didn't have that quality of light on this crappy rainy day. So here it is in color. This time I focused on the raindrops. You know, I'm just playing around trying to find the shot. I like her eyes, but I like the raindrops too. And again, with the flash, it's extremely sharp because it's an instantaneous pop of light. Very crisp, very sharp light. Where continuous light is softer because you're going to shoot at a slower shutter speed and it's a slower burn at the way the light is illuminated, the quality of light. Here's that same shot taking on the hair light in the background inside the lobby of the building, right? And again, look at the catch lights in those eyes. So you see an umbrella on the bottom that's seeing my reflector and my soft box is the main light from the front. And I'm gonna share with you a lighting diagram in a moment. Very cool. So we're shooting 200 of a second shutter speed, aperture 5.6, 320 ISO. Very cool. You wouldn't think that you're sitting in the lobby of a building creating this image, right? Really dreamy. This is one light up high, just to fill on the bottom, no backlight at all. Really nice. Here's the window I'm shooting through, and she's sitting on this window seat looking through. So anywhere could be a great picture. Here's the lighting diagram. So I was using the halo just as a reflector. It, the speed light was not active at all in there. It's just being a reflector because I didn't bring a reflector with me. I had the umbrella and I had the softbox. The softbox is the main light and it's from the top down in much the same fashion we would position a beauty dish. Portable, it's made out of nylon material so it's like an umbrella. So it's protecting the speed lights inside. And then the backlight inside that worked. Here's outside on the street. You can see the rain, it's coming down. It's terrible, it's cold. Why are we doing this? Just to show that you don't have to settle for available light. Yes, you could shoot all day long available light and still get an image. But look at this. 
and I'm a backlighter hog. I admit it. Hey, I'm Bob Davis. I love backlighting because look what it does. It separates her from the background. And if there's any moisture, rain, snowflakes, dust, it kind of lights it up to add atmosphere. It makes the rain shine like little diamonds, right? And it gives me this more romantic feel of an image. I'm shooting. I'm compressing the space. I'm turning all the lights in the background into pin lights because I'm cho choosing to shoot at a longer focal length, right? So we're shooting at 200 millimeters on this thing, and we're compressing the space and the light. And I'm able to do this really quick, having an assistant walk with me with two light sticks. Same shot, right? So quality of light, you know, I really can't stress that enough, the quality of light. And any place is a good place to turn into a studio. So let's look at some studio images. Here's a really, what we call low key image. The other image of Gigi was high key, it was white, very bright. But we could do just the opposite as well. We could do low key, right? So it's very dark and we can control the light output right from camera with speed lights, which makes it very convenient. So my front light in my A group through a soft box, the exposure value is brought down very low. My backlight, this rim here, is shooting through a grid, which is harsher, more specular, giving that highlight on them, and just kicking it up just a little bit more. So here's our lighting diagram. We boomed out the soft box up high, but at a very low flash output. So it's not my main, it's basically acting as a fill. My main light is behind him, skimming a harsh quality of light with a grid on it to give this quality of light on Lorenzo. So then I could kick up that quality of light, like, okay, we're going to raise the light level up. We're going to add a light on the background as well, giving us that vignette look on the background. So we could control the quality of the image just through shaping the light. Again, you could see the same lighting technique as the first one. The giveaway is the catch light is square in his eye. One light on the background with that grid on it. Only this time we brought the light level up and we moved it over. So it's still just two lights. A lot you could do. So here's our two lights, and these were just white card reflectors reflecting light up. So we had some detail. You may not be able to see it because of the screen sharing program, but there's detail in all this shadow area. None of the shadows are harsh. If I didn't use those fill cards, this would be very harsh. This would be no detail in that shadow area. Weddings, portraits. This is the situation where I was using the Rapid Box Beauty Dish. So we're in a hotel suite, and of course the bride, the star of the show, and I'm asking Gemma to look into the mirror and up, and there's no light there. I put on the light stand, the Rapid Box, that Beauty Dish quality of light, and had her look towards it. And it's just stunning, beautiful quality of light. And I didn't need to do any retouching. Of course she's young and beautiful and has great skin, but this type of lighting will also help you if your person does have challenges with their complexion. You have less retouching to do. Now the groom is just lit by the room light, the window light, in the back of the suite. He's kind of an afterthought, right? So I know I'm, I'm running a little bit long, so I'm just gonna kind of go through these images really quickly because I wanna share with you my other lighting techniques. So these are all created with speed lights. So oftentimes I use my speed lights to complement the light that's there in the environment, right? So I will filter my lights. I will add light even in daylight with sunlight because I want to keep that specular highlight in their eyes. Um, this is a, an underwater shot, half in, half out. I use an aquarium to do that. Here's me capturing that image. As I said, and if you're interested in learning all these techniques and how I created these images, I have a downloadable DVD called What the Flash. It's available at mzmzed.com or go to our Davis Workshops, plural.com, and you can get all that information. All right, so really quick, let's, let's just take a peek at some headshots and then we'll get into the dirty light. So oftentimes I do headshots. Everybody needs a headshot for Facebook, for LinkedIn, for everything. So it's a great market to tap into. It's great extra money. And again, I do it on location. It's convenient for the corporation or the office that you happen to be working with, wherever you want to do these. Through the quality of light, I can use speed lights, and I don't need a large space, and I don't need power packs or outlets. 
everything is wireless. So this is my main light. This is a Westcott Apollo Orb. This is the Westcott Apollo Medium Softbox. And here's two halos to light my background. This also happens to be a Westcott pop-up backdrop. And you can get many different backdrops for it. But we were going to do high key head and shoulder shots. So here's what you get. All controlled from camera. Now this is all manual flash so that I can control the output of all the images. I'm not doing through the lens metering with ETTL because if you're shooting into a bright white background, it tends to want to underexpose the images. So these are straight out of camera, right? Great headshots. So here's how we created it. Here's my assistant Ben, and I used one halo on the camera left, one halo on camera right to evenly illuminate the background. Now, if we turn those lights off one at a time, you can see the light coming from camera left reaches about halfway. Then we turn that light off and we bring the light on from camera right and it too reaches about halfway. When we combine them, we get nice even illumination. Now we're going to set the main light. The main light is going to be that orb. Nice wraparound, soft shadows, good quality of light. So I get my light level on that. Check it out. It's cool. But we still need that fill area. Yeah. I could use either a reflector card or I'm going to use the medium softbox. This probably looks really dark to you, but all this is doing is giving a kiss of light into those shadow areas to fill it in. I still want the main light to be the main and to not be even. So here's a combination of both lights. And again, look at the highlights in the eyes. Main and the fill, right? Now we put them all on. All the lights are working. We have great quality of light and we can move subjects through. So it's speed and efficiency. All right, so let's talk a little bit about dirty light. So here's some dirty light techniques. So again, you can't say, I can't afford the Westcott, I don't have a speed light, I can't do what you're doing. That's an excuse, you can't have an excuse. Go to the hardware store and get creative. So I'm gonna start off with a couple of these images and I'm gonna share with you how I created them. And again, beautiful quality of light, Check out our histogram. Yes, it's slightly warm. Sure, I like a warm flesh tone. I don't want to overcorrect it. And again, I hope you can see these images are unretouched because I did leave her blemishes. Right? I want you to really know that I'm sharing with you what I capture in camera. For a finished file, I would go in and retouch these blemishes. But because of this lighting technique too, it's beauty lighting, the blemishes are very faint but easy to retouch. Here she is with her eyes open. Now notice this unique catch light in her eye, the two strip banks. I'm going to share with you what those are, right? Beautiful quality of light. This is all created with things you can find at your local home improvement or hardware store. And here it is. This is a clothing garment rack, which is collapsible, which you could pick up at Target, Home Depot, Bed Bath & Beyond. They're about 30, 35 bucks. They're a little bit extra for wheels, and they're a little bit extra if you want them to be collapsible and portable. Then I bought fluorescent lights, which were 10 bucks a piece, with the lights in them. They didn't have an on and off switch because I was going cheap. I plugged them all into the extension cord. Now, the convenience of this is it can roll. I can move it. I could side light with it. I probably could have added a fourth one to create a nice square catch light in her eye. But again, I was on budget. Oh, sorry about that. So what we did was I was able to shoot through it, shoot with it sideways, move it all around and get uber creative. Now these lights within this great location and all bank vault are just those clamp lights. I call them chicken lights. Like you put in a chicken coop to keep the chicken warm so they lay eggs. And then I just bought, you know, $4 Edison bulbs to put in there so you could see the uh, light filaments to be creative. And then I picked up a fog machine after Halloween. You could pick those up for about 30 bucks to add some atmosphere, right? So here we go. Here's kind of a really creepy kind of cool image. There's my garment rack light in the background, which is fluorescent. It gives off a green color cast. These are the tungsten light. They're giving off a very orange color cast. And then we have the fog from the fog machine. Now I could change this to look any point in time by changing the white balance preset in camera. So right now I'm letting it go towards the warm side, letting everything be very warm like tungsten. Black and white, beautiful. 
but I still strive for good color even with black and white. I just don't let it fly because it's going to be black and white. You could see my histogram in color is all even. So I would shoot this image in raw, but then if I wanted to see it in black and white, I would use my black and white preset on my camera so I could see the image in black and white, but my color is still dialed in. And you can see that fun catch light in her eye, beautiful, soft, quality of light. Let's zoom into her eye. There you can see the rack. So because it's not to the side, I'm shooting through the rack with a little bit slight tilt to camera left, and you get those catch lights in her eyes. But the shadow is soft. There's no fill card. It's just that garment rack light. And it's beautiful, and I can roll it around. So if you had a garage studio, if you're just playing around, this is a great technique. Now, again, I'm just balancing using the tungsten white balance preset. Bam, takes that green right out, and we're good to go, right? Cue fog machine. Here we go. And then I turned on a flashlight over here to give it a little bit of that blue cast in the background. So because it's more in the bluer color spectrum, a daylight flashlight, and I'm shooting in fluorescent white balance preset, it's getting a color shift toward blue. So you can have a lot of fun with your white balance preset. Now this is just changing my depth of field, right? I happen to have an 85 millimeter 1.2 aperture. So this is at 3.2. Now when I go to 1.2, watch that background change. Bam, it gets buttery smooth. And that's just the difference from shooting wide open to giving me a slight amount of depth of field. You can see the detail changing. So again, there's a color shift in the background because that's the tungsten light and I'm shooting towards the fluorescent white balance preset so that Katie has a good flesh tone. As I said, I always strive for a good flesh tone. Again, this is all lighting and things that I picked up at the hardware store for under 100 bucks. Now we're getting really creative. So I ran out of budget with my lighting, fog machine and fog, and I needed one more light. So I grabbed my kid's Fisher-Price monster light, you know, the one that you squeeze and it goes, Ehh! that became the main light for Katie's eyes. And I just gaff taped it to a light stand in front. So that's the highlight on her face. It's a small kid's flashlight. Now I could completely change the look of this image it's just by changing the white balance. So now I shift it to tungsten white balance preset. So now we get a better flesh tone on Katie. And now things are looking cool. Literally, the histogram is leaning toward the blue side. They're cooling off. So we can go even a little bit cooler, right? So you can see the blue, slightly more blue, because this is a daylight, I'm sorry, this is one of those LED flashlights. It's even bluer, right? And then we could shift it back to tungsten. We could back off a little bit on the warmth. And then we could go crazy blue, meaning beyond tungsten. So tungsten is like 3,200 degrees Kelvin. This is taking my color temperature down to around 2,900 degrees. So there's no post-production effects here. This is all what you can do creatively in camera. A lot of fun. The fog machine adds great atmosphere, and the location helps as well, right? So then you can get creative. Here's those floodlights. This is what I mean, those chicken lights, floodlights. So this is, again, shooting black and white, but I'm balanced. I'm balanced for tungsten. And then I wanted to paint the inside of this wall red. And I did this by putting a red file divider, those three ring note, notebook file dividers, over the light and still shooting in towards the daylight, not white tungsten, white balance. So we got the shift, so this is still very, very orange. Then I just shift myself into the tungsten range. Boom, we have a good flesh tone. We still have red in the background. So these are about five bucks a piece, these shop lights, these little uh, floodlights. You could get your three ring file folder dividers, even at like Jewel and Osco for a buck and a half. And you can get really creative. So again, no excuses, no excuses at all. So if you want to find out more information, please go to our website, that's davisworkshops.com. Got a couple books, several online courses, the perfect pair. And we happen to be having a master class coming up where we're going to travel to Krakow, Poland in August. And we're taking uh, 20 people with us. So 
So we have limited seeds that, that are still available, and that's also available at PolandMZ.com, and you can find the information at uh, BobandDawnDavis.com or DavisWorkshops.com. And the DVD is downloadable. As I said, it's got over eight hours of content on it, taking you through what the gear does. Um, in fact, let me just share a trailer with you. If happen to have that. Instead of me telling you, I'll let the video tell you. So we'll do that. Hi, I'm Bob Davis, and welcome to WTF. Sorry about that. WTF, what's a flash? It's all about the light, no matter what you remember, you can't publish it. I set the flash as to the widest spectrum it can be, so we maximize the use of space in here. Remember, aperture is equal to flash output. If I can't make the light any dimmer, then I just either lower my ISO or increase my aperture. Your name goes underneath every image you take, and you should sign your work with excellence. No excuses. There's plenty of light tools out there. Well, welcome to the bad day. Light is light. That's what I want you to take away from this. It's all about the light. This is part of the craft of photography. You have to master that craft and keep your artist your eye. Remember, the only limitation is in your own imagination. Hi, Monster. So thanks, Si. I, I know I'm running long, but I'm really passionate about sharing all this information. So if we have time, I'd love to take a few questions. Absolutely. Remember, you can uh, you could get that. I'm trying to share a lot of information in a short period of time. So you can get all that and take it with you. And I'm really proud of that DVD on uh, mz.com. Cool. No, I think it was very informational. Uh, you know, uh, what did you know? You can shoot all that on the 80 bucks and budget. So I think that information was really useful. We do have some questions in, uh, Bob. So what I'm going to do is jump right into them. Uh, and if you have more questions, I think we have about t a little over 10 minutes for questions. So please feel free to put more questions in, awesome. and Bob might get back to you um, even on Twitter. So um, I think the first one was, uh, about batteries, so what kind of rechargeable batteries do you use? Um, I don't know if you mentioned it was lithium. No, they're they're um, nickel metal hydride, I believe they are, and uh, it's by PowerX. Cool. PowerX batteries by Maha. They're 2,700 milliamp, and they're just a great rechargeable battery. I've been using them for about 10 years now, and they they just are efficient. Now, there's other batteries that have a longer shelf life, but they don't give you the recycle. The electrons don't flow as fast. You know, so I'm not concerned with how long to hold the charge on the shelf because I'll charge them before every shoot. What I want is my flash to recycle as fast as possible. All right, cool. So I think the next one is from Corina. Um, it's a question about indifference. So I have a question regarding the Canon triggers for the speed lights. I know that they're limited when it comes to radio channels. Um, they only have one. Did you ever have problems of locating due to the limitations? on locations due to the limitations of channels. So sure, with the Canon radio system, the 600 EXRT, it's an amazing system, and it really does have more than one channel. It has 16 individual, it's actually got 15 channels, and then the option called auto. So for 90% of the world, you're never gonna run into the issues that I do, because I shoot in a lot of big ballrooms where there's a lot of Wi-Fi traffic, a lot of wireless devices. So in that situation, that's why I always have to have a backup. But for pretty much everything else that I do, I never have to worry. So with that, as long as your master device, be it a speed light or the 600 EXRT or the STE3, you have to pick the channel, be it channel 1 through 15 on the master device or 1 through 15 on the receiving device or auto. Now, there's one other feature that they have that most people don't uh, dig that deep down in the manual to check. So on your master device, 
there's the capability to hit the function called scan. What scan does in every environment that I'm going to shoot in, I hit that scan function, and it scans the environment for radio frequency interference. And it will give me a readout as to what the strongest possible channel is between 1 and 15 for Canon. More often than not, it leans toward 13, 14, 15 has the least amount of interference. So then I would manually set those on all my devices. Now, it also gives you the capability to enter in a PIN number, a personal identification number. So let's say I'm shooting with multiple photographers on an event, which oftentimes we are. We could all be on channel 15 and not have any cross-communication because we can input our own four-digit code. So it's a great tool to have. Cool. Um, Cody, I hope you got that. The next one's from Yash. Um, all the sample pics being shown are indoor or with soft ambient light. How do we use speed lights for softening harsh sunlight? Great question. You know, I mean, uh, they really, yeah, the examples I dove into in detail were indoors, but here you go. Here's really harsh sunlight, right? In this image, it's very harsh sunlight, so I'm underexposing the sky to retain detail there, blue. The car is yellow. It reflects a lot of light. It's being lit by the sun. But this guy, the groom, is lit by three speed lights just outside the frame. And this is using a technique called high-speed sync. So the camera and the flash will sync at any shutter speed the camera is capable of producing. Thereby, I'm underexposing the sky and still lighting the subject. Here's another great example. With this image, this is just daylight available light, and it's harsh. We're shooting on a tarmac of a small private airport. So this model, this happens to be Gigi again. We're modeling with some old World War II aircraft. I got my exposure off of her face. So I have great detail, nice light on her, but I lose all the punch in the sky, all the clouds, everything. The minute I bring in some speed lights, now here's again a speed light off camera left, underexpose the sky, and then light the subjects with the speed light. So here I'm at 4,000th of a second shutter speed, aperture 5.6. Now we're looking like it's editorial, like a magazine shoot. So you can very easily use speed lights outside to underexpose, to keep the sky rich and blue, but then fill in your subject with light. Cool. Thank you. Um, the next one is from Corey. Do you use TTL on the flash? I have been advised to set my camera exposure manually and TTL on the flash. Um, how does this work together? Sure. 90% of everything I photograph is in TTL, through the lens metering, because weddings, events, people move fast. But I use a combination of ETTL and manual. When I'm doing static images where I'm not moving, the subjects aren't moving, and the background's not moving like these images, these are manual mode because that way I don't get any variation from the tonality of the subject or the clothing that they're wearing. The way TTL works is it emits a pre-flash, and that exposure, the flash output, is determined by the light that reflects off the subject back to the camera, and the camera tells the speed light how much power to give or to not give. So at times it could be a little inaccurate. In this situation with a bright white background and the subject in dark clothing, they would be illuminated properly, but the background would tend to be gray. Thereby, the background lights here are in manual mode but the light on my subject's face is in ETTL if I chose to, and it would work just fine. But as I said before, when I do portraits, my position to the light isn't moving, the background's not moving. I like to lock my exposure in with manual. Now, when I'm doing events or I'm running around on location, like these images here, these are all off-camera through the lens or TTL metering because I'm moving, I'm changing positions quickly, I'm changing lenses, things are moving rapidly. It's just easier for me to do TTL. Cool. So I use a combination of both. Perfect. Um, next one's from Sarjeet. Is a light meter necessary? If yes, which one do you suggest to start with a limited budget? You know, a light meter is a great tool. It's a great way to learn to see light. It's a great way to learn exposure, and there's many great options that are out there. Um, Gaussin makes one that's 
could be inexpensive, but if you want to get a light meter that has the flash capability to read flash. Now remember, they can't read TPL or any form of that because that's an exposure calculation between the camera and the speed light, but they can read manual. So there's Seconic makes a great line of meters that also have the capability of reading flash. Now they're going to be more expensive. Any flash meter is definitely going to be, you know, a couple hundred bucks because of that flash capability. Cool. Um, here's an interesting one. Um, when you're using speed light, there's always the shutter speed limit. How do you get around it if you're shooting subjects that move really fast and you want to freeze the action like uh, kids or pets? Or like this couple jumping in the air. Oh, maybe yes. <laughs> right. So this is outside daylight. So as I said before, there's a difference between speed lights, flashes, and strobes. So speed lights have the capability of doing multiple sync with your camera. What I mean by that is you have normal sync where your camera and your flash sync up to, let's say, 2 50th of a second shutter speed. Let's just call that the standard. It varies anywhere between 60 and 2 50. And then after that, what's going to happen is you're going to get a black frame. So as you go faster in your shutter speed, the flash cannot illuminate the frame, right? But if we activate with a speed light, the capability of high speed sync, well then we can underexpose the sky through our shutter speed and yet still allow the speed light to illuminate our subjects. Now that's what a speed light will do, right? So it has the capability of exceeding the sync speed of the camera. So Profoto I know does it as well now as a strobe. They're venturing into high speed sync, but Canon and Nikon and most other camera manufacturers with their speed lights do high speed sync. As I said, this is high speed sync. It's not necessarily what I'm doing to freeze the action of the subject, but it's the capability of having the advantage of shooting at a faster shutter speed above what the camera would normally sync at. Cool. Um, I think the next one was, do you need an ND filter for outdoor sunlight speed light images like you just showed us? So I do use an ND filter at times. This is an example of high speed sync. So high speed sync, it's a double edged sword. What it does is it robs energy and output from your flash because the light is actually pulsating to keep up with the rate of the shutter. So remember here with these images where I'm showing you that this flash covers the frame with even illumination. That's because they are in sync. So the faster the shutter speed goes, it is actually traveling faster than the pop of light to the point where we lose it all together, right? ND filters give you an advantage, which is this is the Tiffin variable ND filter, which I carry in my camera bag all the time as well. If I want to get the maximum recycle and maximum flash output from my speed lights, I will stay within sync because then it's not having to work so hard and tax the flash both battery an output to keep up with the rapid pace of the shutter. So this way I could keep the camera's ambient light, the shutter speed, at sync speed, and then let the flash dial in the aperture I want. So this is using an ND filter, and then you could go so dark to eliminate ambient light that you quench everything. So this is an eight stop range neutral density filter, it's variable. So this is just changing the white balance playing around. Okay. This is an example of flash and daylight combination. Here's exposing for the subject, the light falling on the subject, and you can see we lose the entire sky. Throw on the ND filter, it allows us to underexpose the sky, stay with that, that 2 50th of a second shutter speed, then add the flashes. Here I was just playing with color balance, and we'll dial it back to your neutral. Right. So yes, I use both, both high speed sync and a neutral density filter. All right, um, perfect. Hey, uh, I think with that we come to the end of the session, Bob, but it was really good, very informational, very in inspiring. Um, I, you know, I, I totally think these are still on the webinar, so I'm sure they're very interested in you've kept them hooked to the last minute here. So thanks a lot for that, and uh, we'll see you in the next. Well, thank you, everybody. Cool, thank you all. Thank you, and have a great day. Thanks, Ty. Thank you, Candice. Mm -hmm. Thank you, bye-bye.
Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.